I got the, the book. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Okay, let's do it. Do you want anything? Sure. All right, let's call to mind the presence of God. Thank you, Lord, for all, for all your gifts, especially the gifts of this day. Thank you for allowing us to come away with you for this time to reflect upon our vocation and our identity as persons from love and for love. We ask especially that you would send your Holy Spirit among us for this session as we discuss the glories of your plan for human marriage. May we always be icons of the love of Christ in the church, especially for those of us called to marriage. And may you instill in us a proper and healthy sense of discerning your will. We ask this especially through Mary, the seat of wisdom, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. So we don't have, so hopefully this won't be totally blitzed because we don't have as much time as we thought we did. So, but we'll, we'll try to do our best. Um, but, you know, but just to start out, like, I think it's really, really hard to talk about marriage. This is a really, really hard thing to do. Just like the masculine and feminine talks were difficult to do in our context, right? There's all kinds of questions about what is marriage, right? How do you define it? All of this stuff. But I think the thing that I want to talk about for a second is just why it's difficult to talk about it, even within the church. Right? There are a lot of different understandings of marriage in the church. And one of the ones that I kind of want to talk to for just a second here is this notion that sometimes marriage can be seen as sort of like the earthly or worldly vocation versus the priesthood or consecrated life, which is the sort of more spiritual um, in that sense. And it's almost as if, and this is sort of the exaggerated opinion, I think, um, as if the priesthood and religious life is where you go if you really want a relationship with Christ. Marriage is where you go if you want to compromise, right? If this sounds unfamiliar to you, then God bless you. That's amazing, right? That's amazing. But for me, this is certainly what affected my early discernment, I think, of these things. I It was a very simple equation for me, right? When I was young, I had heard from the pulpit. This was like the, the very belly of the beast in terms of the priest shortage in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And there was a lot of preaching from the pulpit about priestly vocations. And they said, if you, if you feel like you want to give yourself to Christ then you might have a call to the priesthood. And then, of course, I went to daily mass in the summers when I was in high school and college. And so I had my own harem of church ladies who all told me I am their next priest, right? This is sort of just what they do, right? This is just, okay. And, um, and so it's sort of built up to this image of if I want to be holy, then I'm probably called to be a priest. One-to-one -one kind of ratio like that. Um, and that, I think, is difficult because what we're going to talk about today, and I know you have some stories to, to back this up, but what, what we want to talk about here today is that actually that marriage is uh, precisely a pathway to holiness, right? A distinct pathway from consecrated life or the priesthood, but it is a path to holiness. This is one of the principal teachings of the church throughout the ages, um, and there are, of course, differences, but but that's a really key point, right? Yeah. I think to share one of our, one of our stories, yeah. um, we suffered under this. You know, like when you're you're a holy couple discerning, and especially for you, like discerning the priesthood or marriage, this was a real struggle in your spiritual life. You know, you just know you're on fire for the Lord. You want to give him everything. That's the bottom line, right? And so this <laughs> meth little um, group of yeah. women, I mean, it's a, the story is, this is like the peak of it, where he was in mass one day, and um, he, had this, he hadn't been back to his home parish for a little while, he was at college, and this one old lady, beautiful little old lady, comes over to him and goes, Matthew, and so good to see you, you know, this whole thing. And she's like, how's your discernment, how's your discernment yeah, like... to the priesthood? And Matthew and I had just started dating. And he says, <laughs> and <laughs> no yeah. jokes like this, I'll be the old lady. And he says, um, I actually have started dating this wonderful woman. And she goes, oh. <laughs> oh. My stock dropped, man. Right? It was like, I was out. You know, it was like, like, oh no. Like, so she just, boom. Like, we thought that you were yeah. given. You thought we were given to Christ, right? And so this, this was a real weight in our discernment, especially for Matthew, because he was stuck under the, I want to give everything. I want to give everything to Christ, 
right? And so there was not a lot of holy couples in our life to say, there's a couple that's given everything to Christ, right? That's a couple living 100% for, for God. And so for us, it was, it was very difficult to discern, um, especially for you at this time, right? I want to give everything, but is, there, is, is holiness, I mean, is marriage a path to do that? Right, or do I have to denounce that to be truly holy? Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I'll, whatever, I'll leave yeah, it to you. Exactly. Go on. And it really was, it was the witness of a couple mm-hmm. who did live lives of radical holiness yeah. you know, in marriage that really changed the game, I think, for us. And, yeah. um, and I think this is an issue in the church in general. You know, one of the things is the failures of priests to live up to their vocation, relatively clear. I mean, a lot, especially now, right, post-McCarrick and post-first round abuse crisis. But what about the number of marriages that maybe don't live up to the vocation for holiness mm-hmm. in their marriage? A lot of times it's more private. It's a more private failure, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So it's just a difficult thing in general um, in that way. So when we talk about marriage here, I think we're talking about marriage in the context of, of what the church teaches about marriage as a vocation uh, from the perspective of this is one way to live life in Christ, to use Paul's terms, mm-hmm. right? To live life in Christ. And... Uh, I just want to give a little bit of an explanation about what sort of struck me in the church's teaching uh, about this that sort of opened up these pathways to maybe more proper discernment. Exactly. Namely that for every Christian, every Christian is baptized, right? Every Catholic Christian. And that's sort of the gateway to the rest of the sacraments. Baptism is the number one thing. It's what takes you from the clutches of the devil and brings you into divine sonship. You receive now the inheritance of God as a son in the son. Right? And as a baptized Christian, you're received into God's love in this way, and then you are called to love likewise. Your life becomes patterned on the life of Christ in that way, right? And in response to that gift, um, how do we show this love, right? How do we live this love? Commandments, beatitudes, absolutely, right? In discrete circumstances, you live as an individual, making individual choices minute to minute in time and space throughout life, right? However, one of the teachings of the church that is absolutely beautiful is that that's not the only way, right? In discrete moments is not the only way that you live a response of love to God. There's also a response of love that takes the shape or the form of life itself, right? That takes the shape of a life lived in time and space over the duration of your existence. And that's called a vocation, right? That you live the call to love as Christ loves and the call to receive that love um, in a form, right, a shape of life. And that's where then you get this secondary notion of how you do that, right, or the different vocations um, in that sense, right? And so the call to love is paramount. It hits every Christian straight up, whether you're consecrated, sacrament of, of holy orders or sacrament of marriage, right? All three of those need to be that. Um, but how you live that is precisely the distinction, right? So a stable form of life. Um, and so... In that sense, right, um, marriage for the Christian, it's not principally about saving money because you can buy bank accounts. Right? It's not principally because you can beget a bunch of little people to carry on your family name or something, you know. And it's not principally because you can be sort of like, whatever, uh, stably sexually active or something like that, right? No, it's principally about companionship on the way to holiness and to live holiness in the way. That's what marriage is from a Christian perspective. It is everything else, too. I mean, in, in so many other ways that we normally think of when we think of marriage, but that's what it is. And I think it's the only way to really have an authentic, joy-filled marriage um, in that way. Yeah. So, okay, how does that work, though? How does that work? And this is where it sort of gets to the to the radicality of the sacrament, I think. Um, what's what's the definition of a sacrament? Father Vinley Schell talked about the Baltimore Catechism, but what, what's the definition of a sacrament that we're all like used to hearing, if you've been in... Yeah, exactly, exactly. A sign, it signifies something, so like there's a visible sign that actually does something instrumentally, right? It actually affects something that it signifies. So a stop sign, it is a sign that's telling you to stop, but it doesn't make you stop, right? It isn't an efficacious sign. A, a, a nail strip <laughs> that says stop and also makes you stop, okay, that's an efficacious sign. And that's, okay, fine. Okay, so sacraments affect what they signify. The waters of baptism um, signify cleanliness, right? Cleanliness from sin. They also affect it, right? Those waters, they affect the cleanliness from sin. In marriage, what is the sign? 
The sign, of course, is the visible love of the spouses. Right? It's the consent, the marital promises made to one another. But what do they signify? What do they efficaciously signify, those promises? Do they just signify the feeble love that I have for Michelle or whatever consent I can muster at that given time, you know, not knowing anything of the future or anything? No. What it efficaciously communicates through the visible sign is the love of Christ for the church. Ephesians 5, right? Ephesians 5. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. This is a great mystery. And you know what the Latin term there is? It's a great sacramentum. It's a great sacrament. Okay, so the love of the couple is a sign that efficaciously communicates, it efficaciously affects the love of Christ for the church. Okay, so that's that's huge. And that's the way that this works, right? Which is not to say... I know it's like it's like time. No, I know. So it's not to say that all Christians all of a sudden become, they, you know, there's the wedding day and then like suddenly you you love amazingly, perfectly, authentically, all the time. That didn't happen for not you. Not the that I mean, Yeah, that's true. It happened for you. It happened for you. <laughs> clearly, clearly, I'm still trying. Yeah, I'm, I've gone backwards. Yeah. Um, but it does mean that the couple's love in marriage, they're no longer loving only with their love. This is the amazing thing, right? Is that your your love is actually upheld and extended by the love of Christ for the church. That's the, the remarkable God, thing. Right? Yeah. Thank God, exactly. Which is the only reason. If if because of course the church teaches that marriage is indissoluble, which the better term I like is unbreakable. Right? Marriage is unbreakable. Now that would be horrendous if they were just talking about our feeble attempts to love one another. The reason it's unbreakable is because it's the love of the couple is infused with the love of Christ for the church. So the unbreakableness of the bond of marriage actually has its root in the unbreakableness of Christ's love, not our love. Our love can fail, but Christ's love will never fail. And when that marriage is, is made into a sacrament, right, when it becomes a sacrament, it is infused with that unbreakable love in, in really powerful ways. And because the couple's life then and love expands naturally into a home, right, because the couple's love were physical beings, right, body, soul, we require a space to live, right? That sacramental, efficacious communication of, of God's love in Christ actually fills out that home as well, right? The home becomes a space in which that sacramental efficaciousness kind of pours out, and that's the root of the term that JP2 so loved, right? The domestic church um, in that sense, right? That it becomes a place where God dwells, but it's because of the outflowing of efficacious grace that that comes in, in that way. So, yeah. um, okay, so that was a really like, brief, you know, whatever, but, but I think, but in that sense, that's the radicality of it, yeah. is that the couple's love now becomes a sign, an efficacious sign that both signifies and affects the love that Christ has for the church. And what is the love of Christ for the church? How does Christ love the church? He lays down his life, and he gives of himself completely, right. radically, right, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, and so... You know, main point, right? We're called to holiness. Period. Every one of us, right? Yeah. Full stop. How does that holiness, how are we called to make an absolute gift of the whole of our lives to our Lord? Religious life, married life. And in the married life, when you give yourself to the, to the Lord, the Lord gives his very love back to the couple. And this is why it's so important to cling to the sacraments, right, as a married couple. Mm -hmm. You can't do it without the sacraments because you need to be giving the Lord that opportunity to infuse the marriage with that grace, right, to, to make it. So what does this look like in daily life? And here's where I want to kind of kind of touch down into our own discernment a little bit and then how it's played out in our own marriage. You know, in marriage, it's a mediated relationship with our Lord. And, and hear me out on this. Whereas for the religious life, and I think it's in, it's in St. Paul, right, where he says if you're unmarried, um, you are concerned directly with the things of the Lord, right? But for the married man, he's concerned with, I forget the exact quote, his wife and et cetera. And at first you're like, well, hey, like, I'm concerned about the things of the Lord too. <laughs> but it, it, there's it's a really profound point here is that God's love is mediated through my family. Whereas for the religious life, there is a more direct um, putting oneself at the service of the Lord, right? Right directly, his, his ministry, in the, the church as such. For the married couple, my relationship with God, of course, is personal, right? It has, you have to maintain that personal relationship with, with Christ. Um, but also, it's through my family, and God speaks to me through my family. 
And that's a really important point. And I think that um, it's not so much that when I go and do the dishes, when I do the laundry, I have to kind of quick do those things so I can get to the holy part of my marriage where we're going to the sacraments and infusing it with divine life. No, no, right? There's, there's a holiness in the marriage. There can't be the separation of the spiritual things and the physical things, right? There can't be this just like, okay, everyone does their laundry, but I'm going to go pray. You can't be a monk in marriage. That's not the standard of how to be holy in, mar in marriage. You have to be an on-fire married couple in marriage. And that's going to include intense times of prayer, right, directly to our Lord, staying close to the sacraments, going to Mass, doing your devotionals, praying as a family, all of those things. But also playing with your kids, right, raising them, bringing them up in the Lord, having a clean house, having a healthy diet, I and mean, all the things that make human beings thrive. These are all part of what it means to be married, right, and to, to allow um, to allow the family to be fully alive and fully Christian, fully human. And so marriage, right, it has as its goal the procreation and education of children. It's through serving your spouse and your family that's your, your path to sanctification. And, you know, at one time, I this there's sometimes opportunities in your life where I feel like the Lord just speaks really powerfully to you. And when I was, I was a nanny for about 12 years before I um, entered the vocation of marriage. And so I got to see a bunch of different families. You, the nanny's weird, right? You just get, like, plopped down into the middle of someone's family life, and you're just, like, observing, and it's, like, really interesting. It was good but, for me because it was, like, tryouts. I get to see her. Tryouts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So there was one family in Pennsylvania when I was in college, and they had a holy Catholic family, five or six kids. And from the outside, it was just, this was the Catholic family. I mean, they said all their prayers. All the kids gave things up for Lent. They went to daily mass. They, they did the Catholic things. Everything was like, wow, this is a Catholic family. And when I stepped into that Catholic family, God bless them. There are many reasons and various reasons, but it was the most dysfunctional human family I've ever stepped into. The kids had so much spike towards the parents. Yelling was constant. There was so much malformation in the family. And I, it's when I really realized, wow, being a Catholic family does not mean just checking off your devotional lists of, did we do our rosary? Did we give this up for Lent? Okay, good, we're Catholic. No, I mean, I really understood for the first time what St. Irenaeus means when he says, the glory of God is man fully alive. We want our kids and our, our spouses to be fully alive. And that means that it's not just a matter of, of forcing the faith upon your family. It's a matter of being healthy and holy and healed and whole, right? And that's what we're called to as Christians. Um, I'm going to... Yeah, the Lord, the Lord definitely desires, I mean, Patrick's talk was so beautiful, which we'll, we'll go into this a little bit, but the Lord desires from families an authenticity, right? a real authenticity, not to just check anything off the list, but to really be authentic before him. Um, so in marriage, it's funny. It can be a difficult vocation because all of a sudden, you are no longer living life for yourself. Right? You're living it for your spouse and hopefully for your family someday. And I would say that it is an incredible blessing of marriage that the Lord mediates and communicates his love through your spouse. I am so lucky that when I'm having a hard day, I have physical arms to embrace me and say, it's going to be okay. Right? That is a huge blessing of our marriage is to have that concrete person <laughs> to be a reminder of God's love for you. Right? And when you're just feeling down in the dumps to have someone actually come over to you, hug you, be with you, kiss you, and say you are good. Right? This is a beautiful blessing of marriage. The challenge of marriage is that the Lord mediates and communicates his love through your spouse. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. Meaning, <laughs> this is not God. Right? I don't know if yeah. we know this. Yeah. My spouse is not God. I am not Sometimes. God. So we're not perfect. And at every moment, he does not perfectly communicate the love of God to me. That's a challenge because you're like, hey, <laughs> you're supposed to do this, right? But we're fallen. And so we have to have patience with each other and pray for the grace 
to be able to love each other the way that we need. And this is the relief that I experience in daily life is that throughout all of my racked doubting, not about the existence of God, but just what to do, like what God's calling me to do, I can have confidence, right, that God has given me a sacramental marriage where he has promised to show up day in and day out. I know that I am hearing the Lord speak in and through my spouse and my family every day. And that's what he's promised, right? I mean, this is, this is what a sacrament is, I mean, in that sense, right? In addition to the other sacraments bolstered by the others. And what a gift, you know, so when I'm strung out and I can, and I, you know, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Bring it here. And almost without fail, something good happens, even if it's just the airing of, of the issue and, you know, talking it through. But how many times our marriage has been the conduit very explicitly for ways forward with situations. It's, it's beautiful. When I, before I entered the vocation of marriage, I remember, I mean, I was, I was on fire for the Lord. And I pray I still am on fire for the Lord. But in my younger days, I was on fire for the Lord. And I was just devoting myself to everything Father Van Leeshout said in his talk. Right? Daily Mass is what you can, your spiritual reading and everything. And I remember spending times in prayer. And I remember feeling those times where the Lord would ask something of me. And I know you've all had that time where you just say, oh, Lord, like, I know you're asking me to do this. And I know you're asking me to change this habit or to give this up or to, you know, to change in some whatever way. And in prayer, it's you're filled with that love of Christ and that beautiful gift of divine grace to call you and prompt your heart to change. I would argue that it's a lot easier when the Lord brings you something to change than when your spouse brings you something to change. <laughs> right? He doesn't always go, honey, you're so yeah. wonderful. Sometimes it's, would you stop nagging at this? Would you not? Yeah. And I have to have the grace to say, is this the Lord? using my husband. Right? He knows me. He sees me. He knows where I'm insecure. He knows where I'm stubborn. He knows all of those places and can say, you know, honey, stop. <laughs> Don't do that. And what is my gut reaction? Oh, no, I wasn't trying to blah, blah, blah. You know, you try to just hand up, right? But to actually say, Lord, this is the way you are working. This is you. And it's so easy to want to shut the other out, but to know that this is the way the Lord is working is when you are both clinging to the sacraments, right? Is that there's room for grace um, to come in. And that doesn't apply at all to any sense of emotional and physical abuse, right? There's no sense in which you say in marriage, well, yeah, this is the voice of God, so I'm just going to take this or whatever. No. no. In fact, it's the the very opposite reason. Exactly. It needs to be of God. And you can actually say to the person, no, you are not living up to our vocation. Absolutely. This is not right. So, so yeah, so I think it, far from making it vulnerable to abuse, I think it actually prevents it if it's handled properly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so our, our, what is our vocation as husband and wife, the very mission of our marriage? The first priority in our lives is to get each other to heaven. That's our job. I can provide a wonderful home. I can, you know, birth wonderful children. But if I don't Great make... Lasagna. I mean, it's worth it, right? (laughs) If I don't make my goal, number one, getting my husband to heaven, um, then our marriage is is not on the right track, right? And so the goal is not first this perfect, romantic, dreamy relationship. That will come as a gift from seeking first the kingdom of God, right? Seeking first the kingdom of God. We have to recognize that, you know, we're two fallen people that have come together in this marriage with wounds that need to be healed, Right? Habits that need to be changed, vices that need to be purified, and marriage is a purifying vocation. The goal of the married vocation, like I said, is to get your spouse to heaven. And I would add to be open to your spouse getting you to heaven, which might be the harder part. Um, there were some, we were really blessed with, with really great spiritual directors and mentors when we were dating, as I mentioned in the panel. And we were given some advice that has formed the foundation from the very beginning of when we were dating. And it's been kind of through and through the rock of our marriage. And we just wanted to share some of those things with you because I think that whether you're dating or you're discerning or you're engaged or whatever it is, um, these were things that we have clung to for 10 years and have proved to be beautiful and true time and again. And so our hope is just that these would be helpful to you in whatever way, wherever you are right now. Um, as you kind of consider this vocation. First and foremost, as I've mentioned before, keeping the Lord at the center of your marriage. 
if you try, and I mentioned this briefly to the ladies, if you try to place your hope for happiness in your spouse, you will crush them. We were created with that infinite hole in our hearts that's, that's meant to be filled by God alone. We can have the best spouse in the world, but that place that's deep within you that's created for relationship is only to be filled by Christ. And if we take our eyes off of that and we, we place our hope in our spouse in that existential way, like you are going to be my satisfaction, then we're going to be disappointed and we're going to be hurt and we're going to actually crush our spouse because they are a finite human being and that is an infinite desire. right? So to keep Christ first and foremost. And here, um, I just want to kind of stop here for a second and you know, say that there is so much um, suffering in the Christian life. And I, I know that you all have come here with your own baggage and your own stories and your own struggles. And, you know, what's really challenging, I think, in our culture is that when you have a relationship with our Lord, there can many times in our culture, for one reason or another, be this intense period of waiting. You might have been ready to get married four years ago or six years ago, right? And the person has just not come along yet. And we might be saying to our Lord, what's the deal? <laughs> right? And it can seem hopeless and it can seem like just this intense longing and you're ready and I know this is my vocation and Lord, where are you? Why are you not providing? And there is a real, uh, there's a real cross here. Um, and what I would just encourage you is encourage you is just to know that the Lord is present in where you are right now. That you don't have to wait for your vocation to begin growing in holiness. Like the Lord doesn't wait for that. He starts right now where you are with who you are and the situation that you're in. And he wants to bring you to holiness and draw him close to you right now. And so for us, I mean, the, the that personal relationship with Christ is so important because you are going to have to cling to that relationship whether you are suffering with waiting for your vocation that's not coming, whether you're suffering like we have been for seven years with getting married and saying, here's our dream family and not being able to have the children that we've desired to have. Right? You think your vocation is going to play out in one way. And for us, we've struggled from infertility and that's been a huge cross where you say, Lord, here we are in our marriage. Here we are open to you. Why? Why? And if we didn't know how to cling to our Lord previously and to know that there is fruit and, and grace in the cross and in suffering, then we would be a mess, right? You wouldn't know how to proceed. And so I just want to encourage you that no matter where you are, to know that the cross will never go away. You will find another cross and another one and another one, and you will rise and, and you will die and you will rise over and over and over in your vocation. And that's because that's what it means to be a Christian, right? It means to embrace the suffering of our Lord and to rise again and to embrace it and to rise again. Mm -hmm. And so I would just encourage you just to pray and be grateful for where you are, as hard as that can be, if you're in a time of suffering, and to trust. Trust that he has a plan, even if you can't see it, right? Even if you can't see it, know that he has a plan and that it is good. And again, that's less of a vocational question, but more of a Christian point. I mean, in the sense that that's going to happen no matter what vocation you're in, yeah. what state of life you're in. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Saying from there, so just to um, backpack, backpack, just a backpack, backpack, to backtrack for those who just came in. Hey, guys. Um, <laughs> that we have just been given some, some principles that have really served as the rock of our relationship over the past 10 years, and we just wanted to share some of those briefly with you. Um, first, I've said this, I'll just say it really briefly, be humble in your marriage and know enough to listen to the Lord in prayer and through your spouse and through your children, because they will reveal to you all of the beauty and all of the ugliness of your soul. <laughs> And you need to be open to their influence upon you. Think about that for a second. Marriage, you're sharing life with someone. Right? It's a horrific prospect. I mean, in families, like families, you know this from the families that you were raised in. But when you share life with someone, they can see you. 
you know, in ways that other people can't. You can hide really well if you're living in an apartment in Manhattan, you know, and you just go to work and then you come home, you go to work, you come home, you know. But uh, when you live with someone, boy, and you, and it's not even like you're, when we talk about this factor of marriage and the way that it helps grow in concrete holiness and virtue, um, it's not like the one couple is trying to find things in the other, you know, like Michelle oh, doesn't no. even look for things. They're just that They're obvious. Just there. They're just like that. You know? <laughs> it will happen in day-to-day -day life, yeah. you know, like, oh, like you're just a jerk in this way. Like, and you may not have known this. You may not even know, but, but this is, a, you know, right. and it just comes out that way. And that's why I think you were saying the first couple of years, it's so hard in marriage, you know, because you're calibrating in that way. And um, not just calibrating to one another. I think everyone knows that, the whole right. compatibility right. stuff. But it's really actually calibrating to a certain level of virtue that hitherto, at least for me, was not I love there, that you just you know? used hitherto in a sentence. Wasn't that impressive? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, that was really <laughs> impressive. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually from the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the second point here is, is this has been, I think if I could isolate one point in all of this, yeah. it's this one. Be direct with each other. Be direct with each other. What do I mean by this? Ask the Lord for the gift of honesty. Everything Patrick was saying in his talk is what we mean here. Start your dating relationship by learning to speak the truth to the other person within the proper propriety of where you are in your relationship, right? The first date, you're not going to be like, boom, like here's everything about me, right? But for example, um, when you're angry, Great idea. Tell them. I'm, I'm, that actually made me kind of angry. Tell them. Right? When you're upset or you're sad about something or you were hurt by something they did, you were 15 minutes late to our date. I didn't even know where you were. You didn't text me. Tell them. Right? When we, we are so in our culture, we hide behind our phones, we hide behind our screens, we hide behind our filters. It is really hard for our generation especially to be direct face to face with another person. And this is the challenge. First and foremost, what is it that makes you insecure? What is it that hurts you? What is it that makes you angry? What is it that you are grateful for? Tell them that. Right? You you came to my aid in that conversation and, and really fixed what I was trying to say and I was really embarrassed. Thank you so much for, for doing that. You know, tell them. This sounds so basic, but you would not believe, and you know that in any secular marriage kind of preparation, you'll hear communication, communication, communication. This is what we mean, but on a very Christian level, right? You are called to be seen and to see your spouse. So talk with them. And if I could kind of drill one thing, that would be it as, as direct as possible. And so, for example, there are many times where, and still to this day, this is a principle we use all the time, right? Where he'll say some, Matthew will say something to me. And we have defense mechanisms as human beings, right? If you're insecure about something, you think you look stupid in front of another person, you think that you didn't know what you were talking about, you justify it. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I just was like, no, no, I didn't. Well, your spouse is going to see you right through it. Hate to break it to you, right? And you're like, oh, crap, right? Take down the defenses and say, I was afraid that you were going to think I was dumb. Wow, whole new level of honesty, right? And it progresses as you are get closer and closer with that person. But just be able to be direct and to tell them exactly what it is that you're thinking and feeling and open that, not in a spiteful way, not in an angry way, but in an open way to say, can we get to the bottom of this? What happened here between us? Because every moment of, and we'll talk next about this, but every single moment of disagreement or of tension that you may have experienced in relationships in the past is an opportunity to learn the truth about yourselves. Mm -hmm. Every single moment of disagreement is an opportunity. Even if it's over something as stupid, one of our fights was like, What's in a taco versus a burrito versus an enchilada? What makes them different? Very right? difficult question. We you really have to. to I mean, that's like what, what, what are the fine differences there? <laughs> difficult. So even in those moments yeah. when we were like, well, no, that's not what I think. We realized, well, hold on. What's going on? What? what <laughs> what's going on? Right? It's so not great. about the taco. It's about what I, I was feeling insecure because you were saying, get to the bottom of, of who you are, and this requires self knowledge. Right? And so that is a prayer I would ask you to pray to our Lord is teach me who I am. And everything that Patrick was saying, all of those 
the ladder of intimacy and all of those things. Take all of that seriously. This is really the key in marriage to being authentic with each other. I'm going to pause there. I think you had a question. Just like in those moments, yeah. I, 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 I used to be in a long-term relationship and like, during how humbling has it been for you guys like over your marriage? Because that's the one thing like Extremely. in the core of that is like what I found was just like, it always comes along with pride. Yes. And like this, just this like inability to just let it go mm-hmm. kind of thing. So what's that, what's that been like for you guys being married? So if I can speak to that person, then there yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah, please, yeah. One of the things that, um, and I'll, maybe it's part of this point here. Um, there's a distinction, I think, in any relationship with different disagreements or different points is that sometimes it's a matter of compromise. Um, you like to go to bed at 1 in the morning. I like to go to bed at 10. Let's compromise. 11.30. Maybe we can go to bed at the same time. right? That's, that's a situation that calls for compromise. There are situations, though, that don't call for compromise. They call for what is the truth. Very, very different. We're Catholic. There is a truth here. Right? And so sometimes, well, all the time, I know the truth, and he doesn't. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. Truly, we know, okay, there's a disagreement here. You think that I was doing something, I'm nagging. I mean, you all know there's just issues in relationships, right? I was doing something, you didn't like that, I don't think that I'm wrong, blah, 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 blah. There's a truth here. And maybe we both don't see it. Maybe I do see it. And maybe he does see it, right? But the question is, how do we get to the bottom of that? And first and foremost, we know, Lord, remove the plank from my own eye before I try to remove the splinter in theirs. Right? We have to have that prayer first. Not, Lord, help me remove that splinter from his eye because I know that I'm right. right? So it's, it's extremely humbling because over and over and over, both of us have been on the receiving end of going, you know what? You were right. Right. But that has to be something you come to with the Lord. It can't just be, see, I told you you were right, like that dynamic. That's not a healthy dynamic. It has to be, I want you to be set free. And it is the truth that sets you free. So I don't want to be right. I don't care if I'm right. I want you to grow in holiness. And if this is a truth you're not seeing, then I pray to God that he opens your eyes to see it. Right? And that goes both ways. And there have been times where we've, we've had to say to each other, I don't know how to get you to see this truth. And there are times where you say, Lord, I am not God. You go and you pray for them. Right? That's what I just said to you ladies. I was like, Lord, you change them. Okay? I'm done. (laughs) You change them. You tell them I'm right. Right? No, but truly. That's what you say every day? (laughs) So I think there's a distinction. It's not, it's it's extremely humbling, and that's just real. I bet being a Catholic is because we are fallen. Um, but there's also, it's a, it's a distinction of there's time to compromise and there's time to pursue the truth. And I think we have to keep that in mind um, as we move forward. And I think that that's, that's totally something that's distinctive about Christian marriage in the sense that when you, you know, it's all ordered towards holiness, right? So when you bring me something that I don't see, I don't say, oh, honey, I'll do that for you, mm-hmm. you know, in a mm-hmm. condescending way, just because Not I think that's what that you need. You know, she needs this to be the, you know. That will fire her up, right? I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's like kind of sending. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll do it for you. you know, for the Christian couple, oh, my goodness, this is the Lord speaking to me about this. Most likely, right? If it's something virtuous, if it's if it's something, you know, if it's a real issue, this is an opportunity for me to grow. Not just for the sake of my spouse to placate her or whatever. Because the cynicism Not to so make, make it peaceable in the home. Right? Exactly. But that's not what we're... Compromise. Right. Right? Exactly. No. Um, it just one other thing on this, you know, I think in, in the context of dating... What this type of directness and authenticity does is it it can be extremely difficult because it opens you up in vulnerability before the other. Yeah. You know, for you to say, this really bothered me, what they do next mm-hmm. is huge, mm-hmm. right? Because they can either respect that or they can destroy you. I mean, because you put yourself out there in a certain way, right? And my my one of our recommendations to begin doing this in ways that are appropriate in dating is partially so that you can learn who the other person is. Because yeah. what are they, they do next. to go down that path. Exactly. Right. It's an easy way to discern. Right. You know, I mean, really, in, in that sense, because if you God forbid. Get the stiff arm, good luck in marriage, right? It's not yeah. going to work. Yeah. Because yeah. God forbid you, and, and we've seen this happen with friends where, especially from the female perspective, 
they're very docile. They never say anything. Mm -hmm. They never speak concerns that they have. Um, and then they get married. <laughs> and then, and then in a certain way, you can't help but talk about things because things are going to come up all the time. And then you begin to see, oh my goodness, this person is internally not who necessarily I thought they were externally, right? Because there wasn't that opportunity for vulnerability on both sides, maybe as part of the dating and the courtship or whatever you want to call it. So I think that's a, that's a really key part to begin practicing this directness, authenticity, however it sounds right to you to kind of speak about this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not, that's what I would say when you're discerning who to date, you know, don't compromise on this. Are they willing to seek constant conversion for the rest of their lives? If you have that, go for it. You can do anything. <laughs> you're good. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it doesn't. If you're the most opposite people, if you're the most, you know, in terms of like compatibility in the, in the, in the sort of. We're not compatible yeah. in terms of. No, no, we're horrible. <laughs> <in that. laughs> but we but we're both, both striving. I mean, that's, yeah, that's. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. And so. Um, Oh, and this, and this is why, so so just to sort of, and then maybe we can move on because we yeah. should. Yeah, we should do that. Um, just one thing. Uh, what's what's the major sign that a marriage is quote-unquote failing? Contempt. Contempt, yeah. exactly. exactly. Resentment, yeah. Resentment, which manifests in stonewalling. Mm -hmm. I am so resentful. I, am, I hold you in such contempt that I'm not even going to engage you anymore. When you in stop fact, fighting. Exactly. That's fighting the fighting the yelling that you see, you know, the all that kind of stuff. If it's mean, then that could be a manifestation of contempt and resentment. Mean yelling. But if it's if it's an active sense of like fighting out issues like burrito contents and things like this, right? Important. That can actually be a less concerning sign than stonewalling and resentment. Yeah. And so what that's one of the things, that's one of the end games when it comes to when you're not direct. Right? Yes. When you're not direct, there can be, because we all know this, right? When we stifle things and we bring them down and we, we internalize them, right? Do they go away? No. Nope. nope. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it, it begins to boil over. Yeah. Here's exactly. So with Matthew and I, I mean, from the very beginning of our relationship, we were given this advice and, and man, has it been helpful that yeah. here's the difference, right? When you have a couple that's just going to compromise and go, oh, I love you. I'll compromise that and I'll compromise this and I'll compromise that. Where really there's a kind of resentment going on, right? And like, mm -hmm. oh, they have this fight, but like, oh, just, she can win that one. It's fine. But really there's not a resolution. What happens is, is water passes under the bridge and slowly but surely the walls of your heart get built up. Whereas when you... You um, speak to things directly. It might be passionate in the moment, and you might say, no, I don't agree with you, right? Like, let me work it out with you. But after that moment, when you get to the truth, it's gone. There's no resentment. There's nothing building, right? You don't want to let things build. You work it out in the moment, and as the kind of secular advice goes, you don't go to bed angry. And I agree with that, right? You don't go to bed angry, yeah. So one thing about going to bed, you had mentioned that because you're best friends, you right. love to talk, you know, late, late into the night, right. every night. How do you decide the things that need to be said and the things that don't need to be said yeah. in a world where you would want to just talk, talk about forever. everything and break it open? That's a great question. Discuss? You will feel if your relationship is off. Okay. And I think that you all, if you've been in a relationship, you just, something's like not quite right. And you're like, no, I'm good, no, yeah, you're good, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. But really, you're like, mm, there's like this little elephant in the room that you just feel isn't quite settled. Yep. And when that's there, that's what you don't give up on. You say, honey, we, we really do need to talk about this. And when you both are at peace again and you go, now we're resolved, you'll know it. You'll know the air has been cleared. We're back on track together. Yeah. right? And so it's when you have that feeling that, oh, we're just a little bit off, don't ignore that. That's that call to say, what's here? Right? And sometimes sometimes it takes patience, and it's not like, honey, you need to talk right now, right now, right now. Okay. No, you know, it takes patience, and it takes virtue to be able to bring something to the other. But I think as a whole, we really need to be able to just be direct and to, as we would say, nip things in the butt, right? Not to let things go on and on. I mean, that just takes a lot of vulnerability. And men, I have to say, it's harder for you because being vulnerable with your heart and saying, you know what, that kind of hurt me. That was embarrassing to me. I didn't like when you said that about me or when you said this to your friends. Or, that's, that's vulnerable. And that doesn't always come easy to a guy. And ladies, sometimes we have to let the men have time 
to get to that place because they're not always there, right? We're always kind of like, well, what do you mean you don't know what you're feeling? How do you not know what you feel? Like, you know, we're just, we're just all there all the time. Men need, and like even psychologically, men need some time to say, let me figure out what I'm feeling. And I have to be okay with giving him that time to say, figure out what you're feeling, but don't go away, right? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. stay here with me and, and let's figure this out together. Yeah, and don't just dismiss for us men, don't dismiss the wife or the girlfriend bringing something mm -hmm. as just, oh, this is just a naggy woman thing that I have to sort of like evade or whatever. Like, and, and maybe it also is, um, <laughs> which, you know, hey, like, let's right. talk about it, right? But, exactly. but like, honestly, though, because I think for men, it can be an insult to our pride. It can be an insult to, you know, how dare you kind of call me out for this or whatever. Right. And, um, yeah, but that's, that could be the Lord speaking. So, so what do we do? We're stuck. We have five minutes. Um, we're going to do it. Yeah, we should. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. Okay. Okay. Yes, you have one question. <laughs> Can you flipping come to my house for dinner? <laughs> yeah. Would love to. Seriously. Would love to. I'll lay on that like. Let's do be it. There. Let's yeah. do yeah. it. Yeah, seriously. You're so good. No, we'll do it. We'll do it. Okay. We are gonna do this. Okay. Let's do this. Because I'm gonna do this yep. in five minutes. Are you guys ready with me? We're yeah. gonna like. We're gonna do this. Okay. Party. Sexuality. Five minutes. Here we go. Whole thing. Right. All of it. Yeah. Mother principle. Got this. <laughs> Mother principle. If the. If. Marriage is meant to be an icon in the world, an icon, namely something that manifests in space and time, the reality that it signifies, right? If it's meant to be an icon into the world of the love of Christ the church, Christ in the church, then sexuality, the way that we live sexuality in marriage, needs to live up to the standard of Christic love. Okay. All of it. So we live in a culture where love is love is love is love is love. What is love? Right. Christ, as a Catholic, we know Christ has shown us what love is. The way that he came to love us, he came to love us, and I'm going to, there's speakers who do this, and I think it's super helpful, came to love us in, and showed the characteristics of his love in four different ways. One, he was free. He freely gives himself to us, right? No one forces Jesus to lay down his life. I can lay down my life and I can take it up again, he says, right? Christ's love is free. His love is faithful. The covenant is forever and ever and can never be revoked, right? It is forever. It is faithful. It's free. It's faithful. It's total. Christ gives everything of himself, right? Every ounce of his blood is given to us. He holds nothing back. So it's total. And finally, because of those first three things, it's fruitful. The Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. life. Right? Baptism is new life. There is life that comes from God's love being given to the church. So, free, total, faithful, fruitful. When we stand at that altar on the day of our wedding and we commit ourselves to love that other person the way Christ loved the church, we are committing, in the words of the priest and the deacon, he asks you questions and says, do you come here freely of your own accord? Love is free. If someone holds a gun to your head and says, will you marry me? That's not love, right? <laughs> we know that love has to be free. This is why the man goes in vulnerability and proposes to the woman. He doesn't force the woman. Free. Do you come, to, come here freely of your own accord? Do you promise to be true to each other till death do you part forever? It's a faithful love. It is never to, to not be given, right? It's never to be revoked. So it's free. It is faithful. And it is total, right? It's through sickness and in health. It's till death do you part. There is no part of you that's not being given, right? We know instinctively if your husband says, or if your, your boyfriend or girlfriend says, you know, I love you always on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Susie's on Fridays. And No, I need all of you, right? I need the whole of you, the total gift of yourself. And finally, the priest or deacon says, will you accept children lovingly from God? Will your love be fruitful? First, spiritually, will it bear spiritual fruit? And sometimes, hopefully, it will manifest in the physical fruit of children. Free, total, faithful, fruitful love is the love you vow to on the altar. What is, and it's the words that you speak on, you know, when you're vowing those words to each other. What is the wedding night? The wedding night is when you speak the words of the wedding vows with your body. So your love sexually, the sexual act from the married couple, has to be free. We know this instinctively, right? <laughs> has to be faithful forever. We'll never abandon them. It has to be total, the whole of you. And it has to be fruitful. 
Not that you have a child every time you have intercourse, but that it's fruitful. It's always open to the gift of God's life. In this context, we have come to see, and, and in our marriage we can bear witness to this, in our lives we can bear witness to this, that every single rule of the Catholic Church about sexual morality is there to safeguard love. It is there for our happiness. It is there for your joy to be complete. It is not when you have, you know, in our culture, when you have um, something, whenever you have something valuable, it is going to be protected, right? And I always use this example of national treasure with like the, what is it, the Constitution, Constitution or something? Yeah. And Very like, there, yeah. what, it's like lasers and light beams and like keys and locks and guards and all these things protecting this Constitution. Why? Because it's valuable. You don't just throw the Constitution on someone's coffee table and be like, hey, I brought home that. No, no. You lock it up because it is, it is precious, right? The reason the church has so many rules around the sexual act is because it is so precious. It is so sacred. Our culture says you can have sex whenever, with whoever, however you want. What does, that, what does that mean that the culture, what kind of value is the culture placing on sex if it's whatever you want to do with it? It's the same thing as throwing the Constitution on your coffee table. It's got no value. Right? And this was just a breakthrough in our relationship to say all of the teachings of the church are for your love. And it's beautiful. And so when, and we're going to close in, in this last two points, um, when we say, you know, that an act of intercourse needs to be free, total, faithful, and fruitful. This mentality needs to begin in dating and in chastity. Right? Chastity is not just, I'm not going to have sex. Chastity is, is integrating your, the sexuality of the person into the personal realm of your relationship. It's about loving the other person according to where you are. So chastity is going to look different when you're on your first couple dates. It's going to look different when you're engaged. It's going to look different when you're married. But the virtue of chastity persists throughout the whole of your married life, right? Because it's, it's a beautiful way to integrate what your, your bodily sexuality. And so when we say, you know, for example, like this is how to tell, is the way I'm using my sexuality in accord with God's plan, is it revealing the free, total, faithful, fruitful love of God, or is it not, right? And you can say, what is an act of intercourse before marriage? Is it faithful? Or does it fall short? What is an act of masturbation? Is it fruitful? Is it a gift? Is it total? Or does it fall short? What is a contraceptive act of intercourse? We can say, no, it's not fruitful. It's not total. I'm not giving the possibility of motherhood to him. I'm holding it back. Every single rule is meant to safeguard the love that Christ has for the church and wants to infuse that into your marriage. And I, I just challenge you to open your heart and anything that you question, read about, research, pray about. Because this is what we did in our marriage in 10 years. I and mean, we've never used contraception in our marriage. We've been faithful to the teachings of the church. And it is full of joy. God's plan is to satisfy our hearts. He wants our happiness, right? And so I just bear witness to the fact that God, God created our sexuality. And as hard as it can be, you know, in the beginning when you're dating and you're meant to be together, there's this holy tension. You're meant to be together, right? And when you're in a great relationship, everything in you wants to be with the other. Live in that holy, chaste tension. It's beautiful, it's holy, and it is so worth it to come to your wedding day and know that you have discerned in clarity and in, in truth, right? You can see and you're not blinded. You are saving yourself to be a gift in a way that Christ can bless the marriage. And all of these things that we talked about, all of the principles of discernment and all of that, mean nothing if we're not living in a state of grace. And so when you're in this time in your life right now, let's face it, we're in a culture where vice is prevalent. Pornography is all over the place, right? This is not an easy culture to stay chaste at all. So this is the time to say, Lord, purify it. Help me. I am stuck in this habit. I am stuck in these doubts about myself. I'm stuck in this horrible body image. Whatever it is that you struggle with, now is the time to ask for those prayers and to really dedicate yourself to living a life of holiness because the whole of your vocation 
is dependent upon you being able to open those places of your heart to the Lord and say, take it. Right? And so I just, I encourage you, thank you for putting up with sexuality in five minutes of our teaching here, but I just encourage you to just take that to the Lord and, and pray about it. Um, promise me that you'll run over to Mass because it's 354. That anyone, was impressive. Does anyone have any, any yeah. questions before we go? Yeah. As overall, just you did a lot between you two, like that, yeah. that he talked, that Christ talks about, that Paul talks about. Yeah. Has that expanded your capacity to love other people outside of the marriage? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Because I'm more authentically me. You can't love someone when you're not yourself, when you're not authentic. And I just think it's absolutely the more you are loved, the more you're okay with who you are, and the more you can give. And mm-hmm. you can be a true gift of self to others. And that's it. One point, you know, uh, this this question sometimes revolves around vows. Do vows constrict you, or do they open you? Exactly. Right. And I think for for the church, you know, what what makes you unfruitful in life? What makes you not be able to minister to others or whatever? It's your own idiocy. A lot of times, <laughs> flitting around uncontrollably, not knowing what you're doing, right? What, one of the points of some of the great spiritual authors of the church is that vows hold you to keep you from that. Mm-hmm. And they actually therefore make you more available mm-hmm. because you don't lose as much time and you don't lose as much focus because you're not flying around in a million places. Yeah. Vows actually make you fruitful. Yeah. It's really interesting. So so you actually have more <clears throat> capabilities, I mean, in a certain way. Now there's certain, I mean, like we said before, you know, there's certain um, limitations, but vows I think free you in so many ways, yeah. instead of locking them in. My, if you guys have any like more personal questions, if you just Google my name, you should be able to find my contact information because I didn't bring, we didn't bring any like, cards or anything. And but, also, I have to mention one thing briefly. Yeah, yeah. This Dr. Kuhner is the dean of St. Bernard's School of Theology. Did you mention this no, to your guys? No, no, no. Um, there is just for you guys, because this is this is an awesome young adult group. St. Bernard's is offering free audit for their summer classes this semester. This semester. Theology classes at a master's level, you have to have no background in theology. You can just sit in and audit. There's courses on Mary. There's courses on the church. There's courses on the sacraments. It's an mm-hmm. awesome community. Dr. Kruner's teaching a bunch of the classes. And the goal of St. Bernard's is to open it up and have people fed. So if you have any interest in auditing one of the mm-hmm. classes, just go to St. Bernard's. I think it's stbernard's.edu. Yeah. And you can see there's a whole list of summer courses that are coming out. Mm-hmm. Share it with your friends. And we're just Our goal right now is just to get people fed and get the truth out there. So please feel free if you're hungry academically. That's a, another resource mm-hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. And you'll find other community people there too. So just Google it. You'll find me on there. And um, Yes, and we'll be around after for a little bit if anyone has any questions. But thank yeah. you guys for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Now please Run get over there so, so that Carlo and Carla Miller... <laughs> Thank you.